Music, what a concept. And that's just what I will be talking about on today's episode, the rock and roll concept album. Hey everybody, welcome to Tony T's Tune Talk, recorded for the Port Washington Public Library's YouTube channel and available for all. I'm your host, Tony Treguardo, and I'm ready to talk tunes. Keep in mind that the albums I'll be talking about in this episode are probably available at your local library and on a number of online streaming services, some of which you can access through your library, including the Port Washington Public Library. Together, let's take a detailed look at some of the best of the earliest concept albums of the genre, all of which I consider to be recommended listening. Now, for those of you looking for Rush or Marillion or Genesis in this video, please note that my little excursion here will take us only to around 1970, okay? So, let's start with the Beach Boys, Pet Sounds. Now, I have to admit that Pet Sounds is, to be completely frank, a debatable entry on this list. The album's got a unified theme and an emotional feel running through it, but there's no real narrative or story. What makes it unique for a rock album was probably the result of songwriter Brian Wilson's desire to make a complete statement, similar to what he believed the Beatles had made with their newest album at the time, Rubber Soul. Now, up until then, pop and rock albums generally lacked a cohesive artistic goal. And they were essentially just vehicles used to sell a group's singles at a higher price point. But the sonic and textured brilliance of Pet Sounds, the unique instrumentation with its lyrics all about young love and teenage angst, made this album much more than a simple 12-inch platter that was serving up the Beach Boys' classic songs like God Only Knows, Wouldn't It Be Nice, and Sloop John B. Now this is going to lead to the question, what is a concept album anyway? And that's a difficult one. But I think that an album that has a recurring or a central musical theme or idea, or one that gets a deeper meaning across when you look at all of the songs collectively as opposed to individually, can be considered a concept album. Now this is a bit different from the idea of, let's say, a collection of hymns sung in Klingon or um, the songs of Biohazard played on the Ocarina. Now, if those albums existed, they wouldn't really be concept albums, but they sure would be interesting, wouldn't they? Anyway, this leads to the question, with Pet Sounds, did the Beach Boys do something that the Beatles didn't? In my eyes, yes, they did. Even though I'm a Beatles fan and a Beatles historian, I find it difficult to put Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band into the category of a concept album, even though it often appears on lists of the greatest and best. Now, while Paul McCartney did kind of envision the members of the Beatles taking on the aliases of Sgt. Pepper's band to basically break out of their Beatle bondage, the music on the album reflects no such concept. Great songs, absolutely. But a concept? Not so sure. Now, our next entry missed out on being rock music's first double album by a matter of one week. That distinction goes to Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde. But on June 27, 1966, the world was introduced to Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention with the release of an album called Freak Out. Now, this was a sardonic farce that tackles the status of rock music specifically and, well, pretty much all of the rest of America in general. In the real Frank Zappa book, Frank Zappa said, all the songs on it were about something. It wasn't as if we had a hit single and we needed to build some filler around it. Each tune here had a function within an overall satirical concept. At least one piece of material is slanted for every type of social orientation within our consumer group. Kind of cool. A concept album. Going to jump across the pond to the United Kingdom for the British band The Kinks. Rarely released an album between 1967 and 1975 that wouldn't be considered a concept album. The first of those remains a huge favorite of mine. During a very stressed out period in his young life, songwriter Ray Davis dreamed of his less 
stressful youth and of an idyllic and perfect England, the one he grew up in. The resulting songs that came out of this period form the bulk of The Kinks Are the Village Green Preservation Society. Amazingly, the album yielded no hit singles. Now, you may remember the song Picture Book from the album from a recent Hewlett Packard ad campaign. But the small town feeling of songs like All of My Friends Were There and Village Green, combined with nostalgic pieces like the bluesy Last of the Steam Powered Trains, to create a coherent statement that absolutely bears repeated listening. S.F. Sorrow was born as the fourth album of the British band The Pretty Things. This is one of the most underrated bands in music history and are often forgotten when some of their early music really should be mentioned in the same breath with the Rolling Stones and The Who. Speaking of the Rolling Stones, Pretty Things guitar player Dick Taylor was actually the original bass player in the earliest version of the Stones. And um, you'll see, um, you know, he's in there somewhere. But uh, speaking of the Who, well, there are different opinions with regards to whether or not the story of the young SF Sorrow was an inspiration for a certain deaf, dumb, and blind boy that we'll be talking about in a few moments. I recommend you give SF Sorrow a listen. Let your ears be the judge. As for me, I think the jury's still out. In the story, SF Sorrow struggles with adolescence, the war, the British work ethic at the time, LSD, and depression. His solution, to build a wall around himself. Mm -hmm. Where have I heard that idea before? Can't figure it out. Well, anyway, we won't go there in this episode. But the songs alone do not tell the whole story of SF Sorrow. And the narrative is moved along through the written liner notes that come with the LP and the CD editions. From a musical standpoint, stylistically, it is true psychedelia. And songs like Barren Saturday, She Says Good Morning, and Balloon Burning are classic examples of that genre. Late 1968, Simon and Garfunkel release their fourth album, Bookends. Side one begins with the bookends theme, a motif which returns at the end of the side. The short piece leads into an exploration of a life's journey from childhood to old age. Each song marks successive stages in life as Paul Simon successfully reflects America at the time through the eyes of a scared mother, a wanderlust-filled, restless, and disenfranchised young couple, a maturing lover lamenting the end of a relationship, and finally, a group of elderly individuals. Some form of relief arrives in the form of the song Old Friends, though we're left in the end with Simon's beautiful closing reminder, preserve your memories, they're all that's left you. Now, the most famous concept album of the 1960s, to be sure, Pete Townsend and the Who's rock opera, the aforementioned double album, Tommy. The album was released in May of 1969, and large segments of the album formed the basis of the Who's stage show through the remainder of that year and through all of 1970. The album was also adapted by Ken Russell for a successful film in 1975, became a Broadway play in the 1990s, and was revived in large segments during a number of the Who's all too numerous to mention reunion tours. The themes that run through the album, musical themes, are magnificent. They are featured most notably in Overture and Underture that open and close what was originally album one of the two album set. There was a last minute plot line that was added to the story that elevated Tommy to the status of a pinball wizard. This gave The Who a U.S. Top 20 single that still played regularly on classic rock radio and internet streaming services. And a song segment that features the recurring motif of Tommy's unheard cries of See Me, Feel Me also provided the band with a follow-up hit after a live performance of that piece became a highlight in the film of the 1969 Woodstock concert. Does Tommy deserve all the recognition? Is it Townsend and the Who's finest work? 
Well, again, most Who fans will deliberate whether or not that honor goes to Tommy, to 1973's Quadrophenia, or to another slightly earlier conceptual piece by this incredible band. That album is the Who Sell Out. Now, while so many bands in the 60s were trying to be cool to avoid any connection to commercialism, the Who took it in a completely different direction. Sell Out is actually meant to pay tribute to Radio 1, one of the pirate radio stations whose flags were flying in the faces of the BBC at the time. Like the station itself, the band even interrupts the music with little bumpers and original commercials for products like Heinz Baked Beans that are scattered throughout the album. Now, while the original version of the album sort of lost steam as a concept about halfway through Side 2, the 2009 expanded remastered edition adds in some additional commercials that had been dropped from the initial release. And it makes it even more fun and brings it even closer to the original uh, vision of being a concept album. On a side note, the delightfully quirky musician Petra Hayden released a fascinating a cappella version of The Who Sell Out. Now, if you are a fan of The Who album, I highly recommend you seek this piece out. It is quite an interesting lesson, in, incredibly unique. Now, the year 1969 also saw an extremely fascinating piece of social commentary released in the form of an album by, of all bands, The Four Seasons. Yep. The group that had given us Sherry and Big Girls Don't Cry in the early 60s entered the concert album sweepstakes with an extremely underrated and lost classic called The Genuine Imitation Life Gazette. Now for this project, the group teamed up with lyricist Jake Holmes. If the name is familiar to hardcore rock music fans, Holmes is the fellow who arguably actually wrote Led Zeppelin's Dazed and Confused. He went on to become a highly successful jingle writer and record company executive. With arranger Charles Colello helping to bring things together, this team created a concept album that placed the Four Seasons' traditional pop stylings into the psychedelic era. Instead of love songs for this album, the group tackled subjects such as war and racial tension. The packaging was stylized to look like a newspaper with an eight-page insert an especially done color underground comic book. Pretty cool. The unique design inspired both John Lennon and the band Jethro Tull to use variations on it on later albums of their own. In a review for All Music, Donald Gorisco calls Genuine Imitation Life Gazette relentlessly inventive, skillfully constructed, and never dull. It's a stunning example of the artistry of the Four Seasons at their most ambitious. Final entry in this episode takes us to 1970 and the third musical written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. It was the, get your hair done guys, it was the follow-up to the moderately successful Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat from the previous year and it was a concept album called Jesus Christ Superstar. Before it was on Broadway and before it became a film, it debuted as a two-album set in the UK in 1970. The story is loosely based on the Gospels' accounts of the last week of Jesus Christ's life, beginning with the preparation for the arrival of Jesus and his disciples in Jerusalem and ending with the crucifixion. But it also depicts political and interpersonal struggles between Judas Iscariot and Jesus that are not actually present in the Bible. It makes for fascinating storytelling. Jesus Christ Superstar was released in early 1971 in the U.S., and it topped the U.S. Billboard Top LPs chart in both February and May of that year. Two singles pulled from the album, I Don't Know How to Love Him and Superstar, both became top 10 hits. It even ranked number one in the year-end chart ahead of Carole King's massive hit album, Tapestry. Amazing. The album served as a launching pad for numerous stage productions on Broadway and in London, and the show continues to be performed by both professional and amateur companies all over the world. And that wraps up this episode of Tony T's Tune Talk. Feel free to leave your comments or suggestions of topics for future episodes below. Thanks for watching. Happy listening. See you again soon.